alliterate a message. But uh, I alliterated and, and added to what another preacher I heard preach, and not all of this, just a very small snippet at the very end. I heard a preacher preach it, it's been about a year ago, and it helped me, it encouraged me. And, uh, and, and he said, I, and he told the whole story, how he stole it from another preacher. Uh, and he said, but I added one or two points to it. And so uh, if he ever watches this, and I doubt that he does, and we're friends, uh, and I appreciate him, uh, he, uh, I've added two or three points to what he added two or three points to. So it's an evolving message. This is a message that uh, is uh, evident of evolution, Brother Zach. Evolution is real, and this message is an evolving message, all right? But we've added some to it, but before we get to to it. Uh, I want to sort of uh, give you a little primer, and uh, it'll take us about three and a half hours to get through all of it. You say, preacher, last Sunday night you preached to us for an hour and, where's Brother Chris isn't here, hour and eight minutes. Uh, he said, you preached an hour and eight minutes, preacher. He said, and, and thank the Lord for Brother Chris. Miss Jackie, he said, didn't feel like it. I said, God bless you, Brother Chris. God bless you. Gave him a pay raise for saying that to me. Brother Sinan never says that to me. He always says to me after my 45-minute messages, boy, pastor, felt like you preached three and a half hours today. And, uh, but not Brother Chris. Brother Sinan, Brother Chris said it never felt like I preached for an hour and eight minutes. <laughs> Oh, he left that part out. Oh, I never would have thought about it like that, but that mind of yours would always think about it, always picking up the negative side. Uh, Acts chapter 27, and why don't you stand with me, please, as we read the Word of God together. There is, truthfully, so much, if you're warm, yeah, please open a window. It was warm. I did open some windows before. If it gets too warm, you can open those back doors. It tends to trap heat in here also. Uh, I don't think there's anything out there that's going to disturb me. Um, but there is contained, and I could, and, and we'll revisit it. I, I was here not that long ago giving you some things from Acts 27. There is more truth contained in Acts chapter number 27. Uh, I, you could probably preach here for a couple of months on all the truth that's contained in one chapter of the Bible. I believe it was Dr. Hiles uh, recently, uh, I was listening to a message by Dr. Hiles, that was just a week or two ago, and he said, when I was young, I thought for sure that I was going to run out of things to preach because he said, man, I felt like I'd preached them all. And he said, now I've been preaching for 40 years and I realize I'm not going to ever get done preaching all the things that are in that book before my time on earth is done. And, uh, and I've thought that. I've thought, man, now I'm going to run out of things to preach. I mean, there's only, you know, you preach in church and it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and you prepare and you study and you do all these things. And my word, that's a lot of preaching. Then you preach out and you have all these messages. And I have, I probably have uh, eight books uh, of that size right there, full from front to back of handwritten messages. Plus, I have an iPad with uh, uh, probably 20 messages in it. Plus, I have other notes and messages written other places, have m messages written in my Bible, have notes that I carry with me. And, uh, and I thought, my word, I'm going to run out of things to preach about. But I want to tell you that in Acts chapter number 27, there's enough here to preach about for a couple of months uh, because there's so much truth contained in here. And I just sort of want to, here's what I want to do. I want to sort of, we're going to start one direction, kind of like we did last Sunday night, don't get nervous, and then we're going to swing off, and to take a right turn, we're going to look at just a couple of simple truths that really have to do with our theme for last uh, month's theme, all right? Acts 27, look with me please at verse number 39, and I'm going to get you out of here in a decent hour. Acts 27, 39, and when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which... They were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea, and loosed the rudder bands, and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind, and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart stuck fast, and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose, and commanded that they... They which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards, and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. I want you, if you would please, uh, to go back with me uh, to verse number uh, 39. 
And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And at verse number 40, look at the last four words. Last four words. And made toward shore. And made toward shore. I want it tonight, and uh, you'll see the theme come at the end, not so much in the beginning. I want to talk to you tonight about this subject, nearing the shore. Nearing the shore. Father, help me. Lord, I know, uh, I know my own heart tonight, and as I, I was, I'm excited to preach. Lord, I'm excited to preach from this text, from this topic. I'm always excited to preach. I love preaching the Word of God. I love preaching to your people and fellowshipping and being with them. And Lord, uh, just uh, being able to uh, share uh, spiritual truth from the Scripture. They share with me, and I'm able to share with them. And Lord, I pray that as we'll look onto the pages of the Holy Scriptures tonight, that we'll see you, we'll see you high and lifted up, and uh, Lord, you'll encourage us, you'll strengthen us for the battle and for the day in which we live. And Father, I pray that you would help me tonight to do uh, my due diligence and do right by the Word of God and to preach the whole counsel and to preach the truths of the Scripture in a fashion that you would if you were here in this place tonight. So help me to do that, God. I'm your vessel. I want to be used of you. I'm yielded to you. Take what little uh, that I have to offer and please, Lord, use it in a mighty way tonight. Bless your people. Uh, as they'll go out from this place, they need something that's going to carry them through for the coming days and weeks and months in which we live if you don't come back uh, before this day is over. So bless now. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ and for his sake, amen and amen. You may be seated. It's here in the 27th chapter of the book of Acts that you find a very interesting story. Uh, for a nautical story in the Bible, you're not going to find a much greater nautical story in the Bible. Now, as far as a place that contains a multitude of truth, I could tonight probably go at least four different directions. I believe that I've preached a message here in the church about casting anchors in our life, and that's represented here in the Scriptures. Uh, I've, I know that I've referenced this uh, when it comes to uh, the preservation of the King James Bible. It's all over Acts chapter number 27. Uh, and just to give you just a couple of snippets, I'm not preaching that message tonight, but just so that you understand, there are two lines for the King, there are two lines for Bibles. Number one, there is the Antiochian text, okay? And they were first called Christians in Antioch. Antioch is a type of the, the New Testament church, all right? That's why they were called Christians. Little Jesus, little Christ ones. The other text is the Alexandrian text, okay? Uh, and that's where we get uh, all the corrupt versions, every other version, I don't care what they tell you, but the King James Bible comes from ev the corrupt text, which is the Alexandrian text. Now, Alexandria was in a place called Egypt. The world is not, Brother Chris, supposed to give us the Bible. The church is to give us the Bible. The church, the Bible came from Christ, was given to the disciples, the apostles, of course, the prophets of old, and then it was to be conveyed through uh, the local New Testament church. The world is not the one that tells us what God has to say. It takes the Spirit of God to discern that. Something very interesting you find in Acts chapter number 27. There are two ships that the Apostle Paul gets on. And guess where both, both of those ships are headed towards? Where is the Apostle Paul headed? He's headed to Rome. Huh. Think about that for a minute. Think about the ramifications of Rome. Think about what's come out of Rome. Huh? Both those ships were going there. Do you know where both those ships were from? Alexandria. They were both types of a corrupt text that the Apostle Paul is traveling on. And so that's one direction of the Scripture. You say, that's a stretch of the Scripture. No, it's not a stretch of the Scripture. you just got to be a little more spiritually minded to see all the significance behind that. And, uh, and here, now I'll give you just this, this thought concerning that. Think about what's represented on this boat. I want you to think about this for a minute. This is the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter number 27. Do you know that the Apostle Paul hasn't written, what did you say this morning, George eats pork chops? The Apostle Paul hasn't wrote George eats pork chops. Huh? Staring at me like a calf at a new gate, Brother Mark. I guess they should have been in Sunday school. I'm not telling you what it means. Come to Sunday school. All right, I'll tell you what it means. You beat me into it. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, is that right? 
I was thinking about it and I thought the God, Jesus, would never want anything to do with pork chops because he was against pork. And so I had another one while I was sitting over there. It came to me. I said, George eats, and I don't know what, potato chips. George eats potato chips. Praise God. Because I want to honor Jesus. He doesn't care. He's all flesh driven. Hey, George eats pork chops. I don't care if God would like pork or not, but I'll go with potato chips because I'm sure God would like potato chips. <laughs> but think about what's, understand. The Apostle Paul is on this boat. He's headed to Rome. Brother Jeff, he hasn't written Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. That's four books of the New Testament. Wait a minute. He hasn't written also the, uh, uh, the pastoral epistles. Timothy, Titus. He hasn't written any of those. Anybody else, and you can say it, anybody else know who's on that boat with Paul? If you know, if you know the Bible, you know who's on the boat with Paul. Who's on the boat with Paul? Who is, on, who is writing? Luke. Luke is on the boat with Paul. You say, I didn't know that. Sure, Luke's the penman of the book of Acts. Also wrote the book of Luke. He hasn't penned either of He hasn't finished yet. He hasn't penned. So you have four books plus Pauline epistles plus Luke plus Acts. They're all represented on that boat right there. One third of your New Testament is represented on that boat right there. Who do you think would like one third of the Bible to go down? The devil. Sink that ship and you sink one third of the Bible. You sink a whole lot of spiritual truth that you and I need tonight. That's a spiritual nugget for you. Uh, you say, preacher, I think you're stretching the scripture. I, okay, I'm stretching the scripture. Uh, but nonetheless, I don't think I am. There's a lot of representation here in Acts chapter number 27. And I'm not that smart. I mean, listen, uh, other men of God have studied that. And, and I've read after them. And I see that there. And I've studied it and looked at it. And even yet today was looking at it again. But here's what I want us to see tonight. Paul's journey to Rome was a very interesting journey, to say the least. But the experience was an example for you and I as we sail on the seas of life. Sometimes in the scripture and sometimes in our life, the sailing is very smooth. Amen? Sometimes in our life, the sailing is smooth. Come on, let's not all cry. Let's not all be down in the mouth. There has been some time in your life when it hasn't been so bad, when it hasn't been so bad to breathe in and breathe out and take breath and, I mean, enjoy life. There's been some time in your life when you enjoyed life. You say, well, it's been a long time. Well, it's been a long time, but you've still enjoyed life somewhere. I mean, somewhere along the line, all of us mealy mouth Christians have enjoyed serving Jesus sometime in our life. We ought to get back to the place where we enjoy serving Jesus again uh, and, and get out of the doldrums and get out of the dumps and get back to the place where Jesus is all that he is and God is all that he is. But sometimes in our life, sailing is smooth. But I want you to know also, and it seems like this is more now than ever, sometimes it's not. Sometimes sailing's rough. Sometimes storms rise. Sometimes things uh, are dangerous. Acts chapter number 27 teaches us some things, uh, teaches us some truths. What do I do when I'm in a storm? What things am I looking for when I'm in a storm? All right, let me answer that for you. Number one, storms or stormy times can teach, uh, I'm sorry, stormy times can be times of despair. Let's look at the scripture and answer a couple things. Look with me at verse number 13 of this chapter. Understand that the Apostle Paul is going to go to Rome. All right, he's in prison. He's under the guard. Uh, he's a centurion's in charge of him. And uh, he is on a boat, and he's headed to Rome. Acts 27 is the story of that one very simplistic boat ride. Verse number 13, I want you to see that in times of despair, there is deception. Verse 13, and when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. There are times of deception in the storms of life. Now, why are there times of deception? Thank you for asking. We're going to need to go back a couple of verses and look at why this is taking place. Number one, I want you to see under deception, I want you to see because of competence. Look at verse number 11. Nevertheless, well, look at verse 10. And said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. This is Paul. Now, you've got to stay with me in this story. Don't let me lose you. This is, you're going to need the whole thing, okay? So try to focus, and we're going to work fast. But verse number 11 is Paul, or verse number 10 is Paul telling the owner of the ship and the master of the ship and everybody that is standing there, 
If we take this ship, there's going to be danger to our lives, to the stuff on the ship, the ladding of the ship, and the ship itself is going to be very dangerous. The man of God has stood up and declared, thus saith the Lord. Well, where did he get that from? He got that from God. He didn't, wasn't just talking off the top of his head because he was a forecaster and he knew what was going on, even though Paul was very wise. All right, so we're looking at competence. Look at verse number 11. Nevertheless, boy, when there's a nevertheless in the Scripture, you ought to tune in. The centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. We see that there is competence. You say, wait a minute, that seems a little bit uh, backward, competence. He is incompetent. No, they said he was incompetent. They believed that competence is coming from the master and the owner of the ship. I'm talking to you about deception tonight. You need to listen. We're talking about deception. The master and the owner of the ship said, don't listen to the man of God. I know more about sailing than the man of God knows. Wait a minute. Be careful when somebody tells you that they know more than the man of God. And I'm not saying that just because I'm a preacher. I'm careful in how I say things. Because I don't believe in this, uh, this, 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 I don't even know what to call it, uh, this sort of uh, lording over the flock not which the Bible very clearly talks about, this sort of telling your members everything that they can and cannot do. That is not my job. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. I will help you. I will preach the truth to you. I will help to lead. I will help to guide you. But do me a favor. Do not come to me and ask me if you think that, if, if I think that you ought to buy a red car. I don't stinking care unless you're buying it for me. And no, I don't want red. A black Lincoln. MKZ. Oh, those are so nice. I've gone right from not preaching to meddling. I've gone right to coveting, Brother Mark. Coveting. It's in my heart so deep, I can't even get it out. I I'm just in love. Every time one of those cars go by, it's like, oh, those are nice. Yeah, yeah I'll get in an accident. That's a nice car. I covet them. I'm sorry. I, you know my sin now. Uh, you have sin too. You just won't admit it to everybody. I'm telling you what mine is. Uh, but hey, do you know there are churches that are that way? Preacher, we've been thinking that uh, uh, we have an opportunity to buy this four-bedroom house, we have this opportunity to buy this three-bedroom house, we have this opportunity. Which one of those houses do you think that we ought to buy? What? Who am I? Did, did, you see, did you see real estate one out on my... Did, did, does it say real estate one over there? No. Oh, we, so we shouldn't bring those questions to you? If you want to come to me and ask my advice about something, I'll gladly help you. But I am telling you, from personal experience, I could bring somebody up here tonight, not in this room, but that I know that in their church, it was a very large church, it was a very good church, it was a very well-known pastor, preached all over the country. I was a member of his church, so I know whereof I speak. And he had that sort of mentality in his church, you did not do anything. And here was what he said, and I'm quoting, I can see further down the road than you can. Mm, sounds like you just want to be in control. Well, I'd be careful of that, okay? So I am not talking about, don't listen. I mean, if the, listen, if I think that you're going to make a stupid decision, I'm going to come to you and tell you I think you're going to make a stupid decision. I wouldn't do that. I'll be honest with you. You know me well enough to know I'll be honest with you. But what I'm saying is be careful when somebody begins to tell you, well, your preacher really doesn't know what he's talking about. Wait, wait a minute now, Paul got the message from God, thus saith the Lord, and he just conveyed the truth to them, but they said, you're not competent enough to make that decision. The preacher doesn't have a five-year doctorate degree, but Dr. Duflunky over here does, and he told me that the Bible is better rendered this way instead of what the King James Bible said. I don't care how many DDs he has after his name. It makes no difference to me. Because if it didn't come from God, he can bury it in a hole, man. I don't know what he can do with it. It doesn't make any difference to me. Be careful. See, they thought that the guy that built the ship knew more than the guy that walked with God. Mm. All right? Deception. There's competence. There's convenience. Look at the A part of verse number 12. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, Okay, so there's convenience. Here's what they're saying. Listen to this. It's really not a very nice place. So let's move on. It's not commodious. It's not comfortable. It doesn't really meet our needs. All right. How about compromise, the B part of verse number 12? The more part 
advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phenice and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and the northwest. So under deception, you'll see that there was competence. They didn't believe Paul. There was convenience. It's really not commodious to stay here. There's compromise. You know what the compromise came from? The more part. The more part. Be careful listening to the crowd. The crowd's usually not always right. The minority is usually the one that is right. It is not the majority that know what they're talking about. The majority have voted some things into our country that you and I are going to pay for for the rest of our lives, as will our children and our children's children and our children's children, because the more part thought it was a good idea, and now the more part, Brother Willie doesn't think it's such a great idea now that they're getting the bill for it. You want to get on board with the more part? But the more part said... It's all right for us to compromise. But here's what they said. We don't want to go all the way to Rome just far enough for some comfort. Interesting study. The word there that says, where'd they want to go? Phenice. Phenice means palm trees. Let me give you a little spiritual insight here. We want fun and we want sun, Brother Hawk. We want a good time. That's what they said. They said, listen, watch this. We're talking about compromise. This is such the new church age. It screams it right off the pages. Here's what they've said. Brother Willow, they've said, we don't want to go all the way to Rome because we know that they're not right. But we want fun in the sun. Just take us halfway there. There's palm trees. There's beautiful white sand beaches. It's comfortable. This place isn't commodious. They're a bunch of fuddy-duddies. They don't want to have any fun. They don't want to have a rock band on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And their preacher doesn't wear wrinkled up blue jeans and a polo shirt and sit at a table. And that's not fun. And so we don't want to go all the way to Rome and start preaching the wrong things, but just take us to Phenice. Fun in the sun, man. Let's have a good time. Let's have a party. We can have the best of both worlds. It's called compromise. Be careful. Be careful. Because what they thought that they were going to get is not what they're going to get out of the whole thing. 2 Timothy 3, verse number 4, what does the Bible say? They're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Sounds like exactly where we're living right now. So you'll see that stormy times are a time of despair, and that is because of one deception. Verse number, uh, uh, look at verse number uh, 13. I want you to see, we saw competence, convenience, compromise. How about calm? Verse 13, and when the south wind blew softly, supposing, I mean, the wording there is so, it is, doesn't it just sound, think about it. We're headed to a place of palm trees. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose. Oh, it sounds so wonderful, Brother Jeff, doesn't it? Supp <laughs> he wants to go right now. Let's me and you get on a boat and go to Phenice. I'm good with that. I <laughs> God bless you, brother. Big, strong man like that. Get us there quickly. <laughs> I'm good with it. I'm good with it. But look, look at it. Loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. I want you to see calm. It looked harmless, and it promised gain. Supposing, supposing, and there's a lot of people that are supposing they've obtained their purpose. And I want to tell you that they think the wind is blowing softly, the winds of change are blowing softly in their directions, and supposing that they've obtained their purpose, but you better watch it. You better watch it. You're being deceived. You're going to be made, you're going, you're going to be, it's going to come to light. Uh, so uh, we see there, uh, there is deception. Now look with me at verses 14 through 17. Look at disaster. Look at disaster. The B part of verse number 13. Uh, let's look at that. It says, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. Under disaster, we see the sight of this disaster. The sight. Things are okay for a while. Because the Bible says that the south wind blew softly, and so they're sailing close by Crete. But here's interesting. About five miles or so west of the spot in which they've sailed from, there is a place that is called Cape Malta. All right, this, 
getting a history lesson here, getting a geological lesson, I don't know what you'd call it, whatever. Geography, there it is. Geography lesson. Cape Malta, it is where the coast goes from west to north. It takes a 90 degree swing around and what happens is for seven or eight miles before going west again, you're now headed north. You're headed, you come out of Crete and you've sailed by Crete and you swing around and now you're far out into the sea. You're not going the same direction. You're by the Cape Malta and they say that in this area, any ship that goes out into that area loses the protection of the land in which they were sailing by and now they they're at the mercy of the sea. Be careful when you leave the protection thinking that you've obtained your purpose because once you get out there, I'm going to tell you what the world's going to promise you. And when you get about five miles out, the world's going to take a 90 degree turn and the direction you thought you were going is not going to be the direction you're going anymore and you're not even going to realize it anymore. And now you're no longer in your own control. You're now become at the mercy of the sea. So now here's the ship. It's out there. And wait a minute. Supposing they had obtained their purpose. Hey, we didn't know this was going to happen. Right. Maybe you should have listened to the man of God back here because he knew it was going to happen. And now all of a sudden, there they are. So you see uh, uh, the site that is out there. There's no protection anymore. And they say that it could be hit by some very strong winds. I don't have time. Ephesians 4 and verse number uh, 14 says that we're, we're blown about by every wind of doctrine. And when you get out that far, Brother Dan, you get pretty messed up. And any doctrine that comes your way, you start to believe it. You start to fall for it. Why? You've left the safety of shore thinking that you've obtained your purpose and you're headed for trouble. Watch it. Be careful. Listen. Stay close to shore. Stay close to the man of God. I'm not saying he knows it all, but if he's preaching the Word of God, he's at least doing all right. So here they are. Now they've swung out there. Now they're out in the middle of this uh, sea. They don't know what's going to happen. So you see that there is the sight of it. Now look at the suddenness of it. Verse number 14, but not long after. Not long after what? Not long after they swung around there. Not long after they supposed they had obtained their purpose. It's not long after that. All of a sudden, suddenly something happens. And guess what? When you get to that place right there, you're not prepared for what's going to come. Supposing they had obtained their purpose, not long after... There arose against it a tempestuous wind. So there's a suddenness there. Uh, uh, Proverbs 6.15, you can write that down uh, and look at it later. We don't have time. Uh, look at the severity in the B part of verse number uh, 14, the severity. Not long after, uh, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. Man, they even named them in the Bible time. This word Eurachlodon, uh, actually, uh, I, I back up, the word tempestuous actually is where we get the English word typhoon. So a typhoon blew up out there in the sea. Typhoons are pretty dangerous and anything that gets in their past in their path. But not only is it a typhoon, a tempestuous, but Brother Al, it even is going to go one step further because it's not only a typhoon. Now we see that added to the typhoon is a major hurricane right? Don't they name hurricanes? I would assume that was what was going on here. And it's called Miscata Eurachlodon. And that just means a big wind. Basically, in the Bible, they would understand this probably better than anybody. It's like a nor'easter. That's bad stuff. I mean, it's going to start destroying stuff. So here they are. They think they've got it all figured out. We see the sight of it. We see the suddenness of it. We see the severity of it. Now, wait a minute. Correct me if I'm wrong. About six or seven verses back, Brother Josh, didn't the man of God tell him this was going to happen? Amen. The man of God said, watch it, because the people, the things on the ship, and the ship itself are going to be in big trouble if we, do what you, if, if, we, if we do what you want to do. I'm telling you, we ought not to do that. Yeah, we don't know what you're talking about. We'd rather, we'd rather do what the crowd's doing. It's getting things done. Okay. Now they get out there in the sea. All of a sudden, what are you going to do when the big storm blows up? What are you going to do? 
Well, what's going to happen in your life? You say, preacher, we don't fall into any of those categories. I mean, we're here and we're doing what we're supposed to do. All right, let me ask you a question. What are you going to do when the big storm blows up in your life? Because the big storm is going to blow up in your life. None of us, none of us are, 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 are free from having storms in our life. So we see the severity of it. Uh, and it is because of this, it is because of this that the loss was great. Let me give you, and I'll just read these to you and show you the verse that they're in, and then we're going to uh, kind of get down into this, uh, it's sort, of, sort of really the ending of it. Everything up to this point is sort of an introduction. But here, and you say, oh, preacher, you got a lot. I don't have that much more. Trust me, there's not that much more here. Number one, they, they had a loss of respect. How did they lose respect? Let me ask you something. If the man of God stood up and said, don't do that, but the crowd said, do that, and you did that, and all of a sudden now you're out in the middle and your life is a wreck and you're falling apart. Are you going to blame the man of God or are you going to blame the people that you listen to? I guarantee you there's going to be a loss of respect. I'll guarantee you, Brother Caston, they did not believe the master and the boat owner anymore. I guarantee you there was some scuttlebutt on that boat that said, we should have listened to the crazy Paul. He may be a prisoner, but we should have listened to him because he told us that we were going to end up in this mess. I mean, they got to imagine, you can't conjure up in your mind, they are not in some shipping vessel like we have today, which can go through some great storms. And even those shipping vessels they wouldn't take in the middle of a typhoon slash hurricane. They wouldn't do it. It'd flip them over. People die all the time out on the seas. I mean, this is an old school uh, vessel. I'm sure it was rather large, uh, but we find that there's 276 uh, men that are on board or people that are on board. I mean, that's not that great of a vessel. And they are out in the middle of a crazy storm that is blowing them and tossing them. And it is, t it is tempting to tip them. I'm sure water is crashing over and water is getting below deck. We can't even imagine what it's like on that ship. And I will tell you tonight that there, there's going to be a loss of respect for those that said, everything's going to be all right. Let's just go with the new crowd. Let's just do what everybody else is saying. Uh, uh, those guys, uh, I would almost, uh, I would almost uh, uh, guarantee they're not happy uh, about those uh, in verse number 11. So there's a loss of respect. There's a loss of freedom. Look at verse number 12. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, now, what did they do? They, divide, they, uh, they advised to depart. Now, look at verse number 18. And when the ship was caught. Now, wait a minute. In verse number 12, I don't think I'm reading too much into the Scripture. They were in a place that was safe. It just wasn't what they wanted. It just wasn't happy enough. It wasn't lovey-dovey enough. It didn't have enough palm trees there. It was nice but it didn't meet their standards, so they moved on. And when they moved on, they lost freedom. Brother Chris, they lost their freedom because now we don't find them very far in the Scriptures. And whose control are they under? They're under the control of the storm. They're no longer in a commodious place where they have freedom to go ashore and enjoy those things, so they, they lose freedom. How about a loss of control, verse number 15? And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. So there's a loss of control. There's a loss of rest in verses 16 and 17. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat. Wait a minute. Back, in, back on land, you guys, had, you, guys, you guys were all right. You guys didn't have to work very hard. You know, we're supposed to be resting in Christ. Amen? I mean, work is good, and we do work, and we do labor in the work of the ministry. But I want to tell you that where you, when you stay where God has planted you, you ought not to be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap, or we will reap if we faint not. We have to stay. It's going to get hard, but I'm telling you that there's more rest. There is a rest for the people of God. That's what the book of Hebrews says. We've got to stay in that place. So there's a loss of rest. There's a loss of stability. Verse number 17, when they, had taken, when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands and strike sail and were so, so driven. So now they have no stability. Uh, what they would do at that time is they would take big chains and wrap them under the boat uh, from the bow to the stern. And then, of course, on both sides, they would wrap big chains, big ropes around it to hold the boat together in the middle of the storm. How would you like that job? How do you think they got them underneath the boat? 
probably swam them underneath, I would think. I don't know how else you would do it back then. And so they would wrap the boat to hold it together so that it would make it through. Not, but they've lost stability. How about a loss of joy in verse number 17? Because the Bible says there that they were fearing, so they've got no joy. When you get into this place, you'll lose your freedom, control, your rest, your stability, your joy. How about a loss of peace in verse number 18? And we being exceedingly tossed uh, with the tempest, the next day they lighten the ship, so they're tossed with the tempest. I mean, they have no peace in their life. Uh, uh, Isaiah 57, verses 20 and 21, the wicked uh, are like the, uh, the raging sea, uh, uh, which is tossed about. And I don't remember all the text there, but man, alive. That's what it talks about, not being in the place. Uh, uh, and you're going to lose uh, that peace that God has given you. My peace, I leave with you, right? Not as the world giveth. See, we're supposed to have peace, but these men are not in the place where God can uh, uh, do that for them. How about a loss of guidance in verse number 20, the A part? And when neither sun nor stars appeared in many days. We're going to revisit that. Man, there's a loss of guidance. You no longer have any bearing on what direction to go. Where do we go? What do we do? Where's our guy? It's gone. It's dark. There's a loss of hope in the B part of verse number 20. So powerful. And no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Oh, my word. Let's go on board the ship for a minute. Imagine this massive storm, which you've been told that you shouldn't go out into. But you didn't listen, and you did it. And now you're out there, and it's bad. I mean, it's bad. And you know, you know, you're not thinking it, but you know, Brother Caston, you're going to die. You know it, because there's no way you're making it through the storm. And now you haven't seen the sun or the stars for many days. And when all hope that we should be saved was then lost. What... What do you do? I'll tell you what a lot of people do. They put a gun in their mouth and blow their brains out. Slit, slit, their, slit their wrists. Hang themselves. Teenagers do it all day long. Adults. Jump out of a building. Punch, pop a bunch of pills. Smoke some dope. Shoot up some heroin. Drink some alcohol. Why? All hope. All hope is lost. All ho it's all gone. I don't have anything else to live for. I don't have anything else in my life that makes any sense. I can't see the sun. Speaks about Lord Jesus Christ. I can't see the stars anymore. Speaks about the children of God. A lot of significance there. I can't see any of that anymore. I mean, I don't know. I feel like I'm lost. I'm out here in the middle of the sea. I should have listened way back then. And so many Christians are in that place, but so many of the lost worlds also in that place. Because the man of God doesn't know what he's talking about. Children of God don't know what they're talking about. Maybe it's because that we don't live what it is that we preach. Maybe it's our fault. Maybe we ought to take just responsibility and say, yeah, we preach it, but we really don't live it. We really don't love it. We really don't live up to our obligation of being all that we can be for the cause of Christ. Now that is one side of the story. Can I give you, you say, there's not one bit of encouragement in any of that. Sure there is. I'm going to give that to you now. So that's sort of the cautionary tale to the story but can I give you something that is so plain and so practical that may be a help to you? And, and, and I, I pray that it's just a help to you. And, and, and trust me, the two of those things go together very, very well. Because here's the second part of that. I named it Nearing the Shore. I want to tell you that according to this text right here, I feel like we're living in the last days. And I'll show you from the text how we can discern whether or not we're living in the last days. There was a song that was written about this text. It's called Nearing the Shore. No more to cry up in the skies, no more sadness or goodbyes. Joy everlasting, love true and pure. Oh, it wonderful to be nearing the shore. We're nearing the shore. We're nearing the shore. Troubles will be o'er, we'll suffer no more. Trials all past, victory at last. Oh, it is wonderful to be nearing the shore. Glorious peace that never will cease. Heartaches can enter the, those beautiful streets. No pain, no care, no rich, nor poor. Oh, isn't it wonderful to be nearing the shore? I see the lighthouse, Jesus divine. Who will say, welcome, children of mine. Come in and rest. This land possess. Oh, it is wonderful to be nearing the shore. We're nearing the shore. We're nearing the shore. 
Troubles soon will be over, we'll suffer no more. Trials all pass and victories at last. Oh, it's wonderful to be nearing the shore. Now imagine, let's now look at it from another aspect and let's look at the Apostle Paul and let's look at young Luke uh, there as they travel. And guess what? I see in the last half of these scriptures right here that there is not only are storms a time of despair, but storms are a time of deliverance. Because Brother Jeff, he's about to be delivered. And he's about, he's very, very close. Because of this storm, he's nearing the shore. Let's look at some very practical things. And I promise these are very easy. I realize from the story that the storm is pushing me closer to shore. Even though I cannot see the shore. See, the Apostle Paul knew that he was getting near shore, but he couldn't see it. He's still a ways out in the water, but he knows that that's where the storm is taking him because, and there's several factors behind that, but, but one of the overriding factors is because he has the promise of God that he still has work that he has to do. He's nearing the shore. Now, from a spiritual aspect, I want you to think about this. We're nearing the shore. And I'm talking about heaven shore. And there are places here in this text that show me that I'm nearing the shore. There are markers that show me that I'm nearing the shore. How do I know that? Number one, because in verse number 27a, look at it. But when the 14th night was come, and we were, here's the word, driven up and down in Adria. I want you to see, number one, I know that we're nearing the shore because we are driven. We're driven. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean, we're not in charge anymore. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean, we are living in an accelerated pace of life. Would you agree with me on that tonight? Daniel uh, chapter 12, uh, Daniel 12 and verse number 4. Oh, I pray I can turn there quickly. Ezekiel, Daniel, I'm there. Daniel 12 and verse number 4. He talked about this very same thing. Daniel 12 and verse number 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even the time of the end. Now here it is. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. How do I know that we're nearing the shore? Because I am telling you right now that we are being driven. The ship is not controlled by the sailors, but the ship is controlled by the storm. And how many of you in this room tonight don't feel like the ship is being controlled by the sailors anymore, but I want to tell you, this ship's being controlled by the storm. And you and I don't really feel like we don't have control anymore. By the way, we ought to relinquish control to him, but when we're in the midst of the storm, we don't have control of the wheel. I mean, man, we're just being driven, and life is like, go, 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 go. Somebody slow me down. I'm going to have a heart attack. I mean, we all feel that way. It's like, I need a day off. I need a minute off. I need time off. I need to get away from the cell phone and Facebook and Twitter, and I need to get away from this. I need to slow down. Oh my word. And it's more and more and more. And it's news and it's this and it's that. And they're just pumping stuff out all the time. I mean, Brother Wheeler, we're being driven. There's no such thing as a laid back lifestyle anymore. At least not in this area. Maybe in some parts of the world. But even in those parts of the world where you would think, and I've been to some of those places, they're still driven. I mean, missionary, missionary in, in, in uh, uh, Honduras that you guys went and stayed with. He didn't lay around in bed, did he? living in a remote part of the world, but it's go, 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 got to get this done, got to get that done. Why, I got to stay up with this, got to stay up with that. My word, we're being driven. And look at this ship, it's out in the middle of this storm, and it's being driven. So number one, I think we're nearing the shore because we're being driven. Number two, I think we're nearing the shore because it has been deemed. Deemed. It's in the B part of verse number 27. Look at it. And about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near some country. It's a very interesting thing. You know what the word deemed means? It's a nautical term. I like this one. It just simply means, get ready. They felt it. It's a nautical term for a feeling. They didn't have any idea, Brother Raby, where the shore was, but they deemed they drew near shore. And I tell you tonight that I deem that we're drawn near shore. I'm not an authority. I'm not predicting any dates. I'm just telling you something inside me just feels. Like you say, we don't go by feelings. Uh -uh, there's something inside me that just feels like we're nearing the shore. 
I'm just deeming it in my life that somewhere I'm getting awful near that shore. I mean, it just seems like it's right over the horizon. It's not very far because my word, the storm is bad and I just want to get out of it. So he deemed it. Hey, they didn't have any idea where shore was, but listen, these are sailors. And hey, those of you and uh, those of you and I that have been sailing these seas for a long time, Brother Jeff, we can deem when we're getting near shore. We know when the time's coming. We've been out on the seas of life long enough to know that shore can't be that far away. So you see that they, they're driven and it's deemed. How about this? Uh, look with me. Uh, at uh, uh, verse number, oh my word, I didn't write it down, but I know it's right in here. Uh, uh, verse number 28, and sounded, and sounded, and uh, uh, found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Here's the, nec here's the next one. Not only is it driven, not only are we, is it deemed, but it's depthless. That's a big word. Depthless, do you know what it means? Not deep. What do you mean by that, preacher? Twofold. Number one, we have a lot of shallow Christianity. A lot. They got no more depth in them than a Christian that's been saved for five minutes. And they have been saved for 20 years, 30 years, 10 years. And they're shallow, shallow, shallow everything bothers them everything uh, offends them i don't like that i don't like this wah 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 shallow christianity makes me want to vomit and it does god too by the way shallow i mean couldn't preach spiritual truths to shallow christians because they wouldn't get them it'd just be like shoop what does that have to do with me shallow. Don't read their Bible. Don't find out what God has for them. Don't know what God's will is. You've been saved for 10 years. What do you, how do you not know what God's will is for your life? How do you not know that God wants you? I mean, man alive, you've been saved for more than five seconds. You ought to know what God wants for shallow. I'm telling you, we're, we're getting near shore, Brother Wheeler, because shallowness abounds. But there's a second fold to that. There's an interesting story in the book of Luke, chapter number 5. There's some fishermen there. And those fishermen are washing their nets. Jesus comes along and he says, launch out into the deep and cast your nets for a draft. And they said, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. And Jesus said, launch out into the deep. And what happens? They go out into the deep water. They cast their nets and the Bible says, and they caught a great draft a great draft of fish, and they pulled that into the boat, and they had a great draft. And here's another reason. Shallow, shallow number one in Christianity, shallow number two, the waters. And Brother Wheeler knows this better than anybody because of his, his ministry. The shallow, there's not a whole lot of fish in the shallows. Fishing is rough, Brother Chris, in the day and age in which we live. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, you say, oh, now you're going to start preaching that soul winning was easier back in those days. The water was a little deeper back then. People had a little bit more of a God conscience. People understood right and wrong. Nowadays, you knock on people's door, not interested. Not, we don't want it. Don't want that junk. We don't, we don't believe in God. We don't believe in any of that. We got all kinds of religion. We got all these other things. It's shallow. I'm going to tell you, there ain't many fish in the shallows. There ain't many fish in the shallows. It's tough. Launch out into the deep. So I tell you, we're living shallow Christianity, shallowness, even when it comes to salvation. And that's not an excuse. Uh, there are still plenty of fish in the sea. Amen. Amen. And we go out and we find them. All right. How about this one? Verse 18 uh, and verse 19, verse number 38. We're not going to read it all. Uh, but here's what we have. We have a discarding. In verses 18 and 19, you know what they did? They threw the tackling of the ship over. Uh, they threw everything. It says they lightened the ship. Verse number 38, uh, you got to see this one. It says, and when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. Some junk we need to get out of our lives. Some junk we need to throw over the side of the boat. And when we get in the middle of the storm, it's a good time to get some junk out of your life. But be careful what you throw overboard. Guess what is in verse number 38? First of all, they threw the tackling of the ship out. Brother Al, don't you think they'd need that stuff? <laughs> but now wait, verse number 38. So they throw everything that really they're going to need overboard. 
They've thrown necessary. They've thrown a lot of unnecessary, but they've also thrown necessary. There's a lot of people throwing necessary stuff overboard, but watch. In verse number 38, they throw the wheat overboard. Do you know that that was what they were carrying to get to the port in which they were going? It was the load. They were carrying a load of wheat, and guess what? I realize as I look around, I know we're nearing the shore because wheat is also a representation of the Word of God, and a lot of people are just throwing the principles of the Word of God over with the side of the ship. We don't need it anymore. What do we need a Bible for? Dr. Phil can help us. <laughs> Stinking Oprah can help me. Yeah. And Ellen Degenerate. <laughs> and all the rest of them that are out, they can help me. We don't need the Bible. We don't need God's Word. Let's just throw all of that stuff overboard because we don't need it anymore. I'm going to tell you, we're near and shore because I'm watching people throw stuff overboard and I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're keeping the stuff you ought to be throwing overboard and throwing the good stuff overboard. I mean, the wheat was where they were going to make all their money. That was the thing that they needed to take into port with them. And so you see there, uh, the, they, they threw the important stuff, the payload of the ship. How about verse number 20? There's despair. Uh, we talked about it. They didn't see uh, any land. They did, or I'm sorry, they didn't see sun. They didn't see stars. Uh, and they knew that they wouldn't have any hope. Do you know that uh, only the lost don't have hope in Ephesians 2, verse number 12? But you and I, Christian, we ought to have hope. Hope in God. Hope in God. But do you see something there? And we're going to have to move on. Do you see something very important there in the Scriptures? You've got to look at the wording, and you ought to circle it. There is a two-letter word about three-quarters of the way through there. That ought to jump off the pages at you. You know what? It's so simple, you're going to overlook it. It's the word we. Brother Mark, do you know what? Paul and Luke felt despair and hopelessness too. Who's writing? Luke, right? What did he say? When sun nor star, a, a stars appeared for many days, all hope that they should be saved was then lost. Your Bible says all hope that we, Paul, we're going to die. Paul said, maybe. I mean, I haven't seen the sun either, Luke. I mean, I don't know. It's looking pretty bleak. How many people are in despair? Christians haven't seen God in a long time. Haven't walked with God, haven't got anything from God, haven't got anything from God's people. And I mean, your life has become a life of despair. All hope that Christ is coming back is lost. Even Christians don't believe it anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get this and I'm going to die. Jesus ain't going to come back before that happens. How, how do you know that? Who, who told you that? Did you get some news bulletin that I didn't get? We live in despair. It's dangerous, verse number 41. It's dangerous. Falling into two places. Falling into a place where two seas met. They ran the ship of foreground. Do we not live in dangerous time? In the last days, we, we studied it. How long? Perilous time shall come. It's dangerous. There's deceivers, verse number 30. And the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they had let down the boat in the sea under color. The word color in the King James Bible means pretense. They said, we're going to go drop some anchors and help the rest of the boat. And they got in the back of the boat and let a boat down. And Paul said, hey, hey, unless they get back in the boat, they can't be saved. They're escaping and they're lying. No, we want to let some more anchors out. Liars. We got a lot of deceivers around us. Deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 3.13, lastly, verse 41. It's disastrous. Falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the four parts.